Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, good. Wow. I'm going to be preaching a different message now this morning, and uh, no. Uh, I am grateful. I don't wish five and a half feet of snow on anybody, but uh, I am grateful that we only got like that much. Uh, we all know what it's like to feel judged by someone. And what's interesting is how quickly in our life we learn both the painful effects of being judged as well as the capacity of judging others. Kids at a very young age start finding faults, things that are inadequate, things that don't measure up. And they will call it to the attention of others and usually it involves name calling. And so we seem to have an innate ability to judge other people. And in our capacity to do that, we discover that it also causes some pain on others. And we kind of know that because when we're judged, it causes pain on us. And there's any number of reasons a person can be judged. We can be judged because of our height. We can be judged because of our weight. We can be judged because of our hair or lack of hair. We can be judged because of, of our appearance, our attractiveness. We can be judged over how well we perform in academics. We can be judged at our abilities in athletics. Like, there doesn't seem to be any shortage of judgment. And we learn this very, very early get any group of kids, have them pick teammates to go into a sport against each other. They don't care how you feel. They want to win. And so they don't care if you're the last person chosen. And we all experience what that's like. And we all know what it's like to judge. And we don't just judge. That would be bad enough. We actually prejudge. Some of us judge before we even show up. That's what the word prejudice is, to prejudge someone before you even get a chance to interact with them. And so as it turns out, Jesus had some strong words to say about this. And we're in Matthew, the seventh chapter, beginning in verse one. And this is the beginning of the, the last part of the Sermon on the Mountain. This is what he says. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Judging. Jesus has some strong words to say about it. And what he tells us is there's really two reasons we shouldn't judge. And the first is this. We should not judge others because our judgment is always incomplete. There's stuff we don't know. The challenge is, is that all we have to see is enough to jump to a conclusion. And we feel pretty good about the conclusion that we jumped to. And so we'll, we'll lock in on that. And what Jesus is saying is, is that you can't trust your capacity to see what's wrong in someone else's eye or someone else's life because your own eyes have been impacted by what's wrong in us. And while we're trying to go after the little speck of sawdust in someone else, our chance of even seeing it clearly is severely complicated because we're all corrupted by sin. So. We don't want someone trying to take something out of our eye when, when uh, they walked up to us with a, a, a dog to help guide them and a, and a walking stick. And what Jesus says is, is that we have these huge obstructions and we should start with the assumption, I'm not seeing this clearly. Oh, yes, I am, Pastor. I see it very clearly. You saw something. But at best, it was in your peripheral. And at best, it was distorted. And at best, it was obstructed. 
And now we're going to act on that information. And Jesus says, that's really not a good idea. There's only one person who sees it all, and that's God. And that's why Jesus insists that we leave the judging up to God. He's the only one who gets it right. He's the only one who knows it all. He's the only one who sees it all. We can't see what's going on in a person's heart. We can't see what their motives were. We can't see the pressures that they were under. We can't see the pain that they were processing. We can't see the panic that they were going through. We can't see any of that. All we see is one little thing out of the corner of our eyes, and we're certain, we're certain that we're right about that. And Jesus says, you're not right. You have distorted vision. You have incomplete information. So we shouldn't judge. But then he says, we should also not judge or we will be judged. The question is, by who's going to be doing this judging? And I think there are two answers, and I think they're both right. And the first is God. So what would God judge you for? Well, first, he would judge you for judging. That's God's responsibility, not ours. Who put us on his throne? Who, who made us the king of judging with our inadequate information and our, and our distorted vision? But then that's not all there is because when we judge, it also says that we will be judged, and I think by others. I'm sure you've seen it. You've had it happen. I'm positive. Where somebody judged you, and then you decided to notice things about them that were inadequate, right? Somebody makes fun of something about you, and then what do you do? You go back and you find something to poke fun about them. This is the oldest tradition since man fell. As soon as God called Adam into account for the failure and the falling in the garden, what does he do? He starts focusing on Eve. It's an amazing thing that humans do. Once we know where our inadequacies are, we figured something out. We figured out well, I don't like it when people point that out to me. I'll bet they wouldn't like it when I point it out to them. And then we become these, these, these first strike people. We don't even want to wait to retaliate. We want to get the first strike in. And here's the thing. If you're judged, you just want to judge back. And it's amazing how people generate this, this what was it, Newton's third law? of motion? No? <laughs> I think it was Newton's third law of motion. You can correct me. You can judge me. Um, third law of motion where every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we assume that when we judge, there's no reaction back. It's just simply not true. That when we judge, we set forces in motion. Something's going to come back at us. And so many people are doing this so much of the time. And it's really not healthy. And, and we feel so confident when we do it. And then Jesus tells us this, that our judging actually leads to hypocrisy. He said, you hypocrite. You got this plank in your own eye. You're trying to do microsurgery on somebody else. He says, deal with the plank that's in your own eye. There's something about, about judgment. There's something about us that when we see something in somebody else, oh, well, let's just check this. I actually have a way to prove this. How many parents do we have in the room? How many know that the thing that bugs you most about your kid is the thing that's most like you? <laughs> Isn't this true? I just hate when I see a little version of myself coming back at me. Just Somebody should fix that. That's the tendency. We tend to just pay attention. Just pay attention. I wish I didn't have to say this, but we all know it's true, right? If you find some, some preacher on television who's really bothered by certain kinds of sins in society, it's only a matter of time before it comes out. 
They're trapped in those same things. It's, it's part of their anger and part of their strategy. If other people would stop sinning, then maybe I wouldn't be so tempted by it. And it's a bad strategy. And we wind up being hypocrites. And Jesus said, that's no way to go about your spiritual life. And remember, what he's trying to do is he's trying to expand and multiply the capacity of a group of people to be blessers and healers. This talk starts out on a mountain with his disciples. Now, multitudes are starting to gather and they're overhearing the things that Jesus is saying. But what he's telling them, if you really want to be an influence for the kingdom of God in our world, if you want to be the kind of people who can bless and who can heal, one of the things you've got to do is just stop judging. Because when you go in down this road of judging, there's no way to do it without becoming a hypocrite. It's not possible. And then Jesus confuses us. Because the next thing he says sounds like judging. Verse 6, do not give dogs what is sacred? Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What is Jesus saying? Don't judge anyone except the dogs and the pigs. By the way, that is an expression. There's no way you can call someone a dog or a pig and they take it as a compliment. Don't get me wrong. I like dogs and I enjoy bacon, but call me a dog or a pig. I'm not seeing that as a positive in any light. It's just how the system works. So what is Jesus saying here? Is he reverted to name calling now? No. He's helping us understand something about how to not be a judging person. What he's showing us is he's saying, when you try to impose something, what are they? Sacred things and things that are valuable. And when you try to impose them on other people and they don't share those values, they won't respond well. So this is what he's saying. Do not try to impose your values on people who do not share your values. You can give a crucifix to a dog. You're going to be offended at what he does with it. You can give pearls to a pig. You're going to be offended at what they do with it. What do we try to do? We have things that are sacred to us and things that are valuable to us. And then when we see others that those are not their values, what do we try to do? We try to impose them. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to share our values, but that's a very different thing from trying to impose our values on people who don't share our values and people don't respond well to that. He says they'll trample those things under and they'll turn on you and try to devour you. Anybody ever been bitten by an animal? Anybody been bitten by a dog? I've been bitten multiple times by multiple dogs. <laughs> Evidently, I give off a, a smell <laughs> similar to bacon. I don't know. <laughs> and dogs just beeline me. And, and I don't much appreciate that. And it's not just big dogs. I've been bitten by little dogs, too. So what, are we, what is he saying here? He's saying that to try to impose, this is something I value, therefore you have to, therefore you cannot. And the more we try to impose it on people who don't share that, those values, all they do is they turn on us and they become angry. This is one of the reasons why the church is failing to reach our culture for Christ today, is we keep trying to force things that are important to us on people that it's not important to them. And you don't like it when somebody does it to you. Why do we think they would like it? It's a challenge, isn't it? What are we supposed to do? This is really important. We're not, we're not supposed to, well, let me put it this way. We're, supposed to, we're not supposed to discern if they are worthy. We're supposed to discern if they are ready. There's the difference. I can judge you. You're not worthy. This isn't Jesus saying, so don't share sacred things. Someone may not be ready for those things yet. 
so you don't give them to them yet. You look for an open window of opportunity. You look for someone who has some interest. You look for a question that someone might ask. So aren't we supposed to be, aren't we supposed to stand for righteousness in our world today? Yes, absolutely. How do we do that? For far too many people, the way they've defined standing for righteousness is trying to impose righteousness on other people. And that is not the same thing. And we have to, we have to get away from that definition. That definition is ruining our capacity to be able to influence the culture around us. Well, then how do we stand for righteousness? You ready? Live righteously. The church has ideas about human sexuality. But when you look at the church's track record of how they live out their sexual ethic and how marriage goes, not that impressive. And what the world hears is, you should at least be as miserable as I am. How attractive is that? You know, when first century Christianity, as the gospel began to spread westward, they went into civilizations where it was very common for men to stop by the temple for engaging in prostitutes on their way home. It was very common for men to have four wives. That was considered legal. It was not, there was nothing wrong in society about that. And you know how the church changed people's views about that? It wasn't by imposing a biblical value on them or passing a law so that no one would live differently than that, or if they did, they'd be punished for it. What they did is they invested in their marriages. And when people saw what a happy couple that was and what a happy family that was, other people wanted to be like that. And there it was. There was the opportunity. They were ready. And they had something to share. If you want to stand for righteousness... Live righteously. If, if, you're, if you're not happy with something that's wrong in your life, and that should be all of us, then rather than find someone else who's even worse and pointing a finger of blame, why not take a deep look inside of ourselves and ask God for help on dealing with those issues so we can live the kind of life that he intends for us? This is what he says, and uh, what Peter says in 1 Peter 3. He says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Live in such a way people have questions. How do you respond? With gentleness, with respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior, those who are judging you in Christ, may actually be ashamed of their behavior. When you live as someone who wants to bless, when you live as someone who takes your word seriously and tries to keep your promises, when you live trying not to make someone else the object of your anger, when you live as a calm presence in the life of others, they're going to have questions for you. That's how we stand for righteousness. Our world will not become followers of Jesus through our judgment. Our world will become followers of Jesus through our example. No, don't get me wrong. Judging is easier, and we have an innate capacity for it. But this is what Jesus says. And then he goes on. It looks like he's changing topics, but he's not. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What is Jesus doing? What is he saying here? And what he's saying is, it's very hard to pray when we're judging. Ask, seek, knock. Now remember, he's already given us the Lord's Prayer. And in that, 
identify three very, six very specific things, three about God and three things about us that we are to pray consistently. But now he kind of throws open the windows of prayer to all kinds of capacity. And he talks about asking, but he, he doesn't regulate what we're to ask about and, and seeking. And he doesn't regulate what we're to seek and, and knocking. And he doesn't regulate which doors that we knock on. He just, he just says, do this. So how are we to think about this? Like, is Jesus basically saying, here's a... Here's a limitless debit card. Just use it on whatever you want, whenever you want. And that's what it sounds like because he says, because everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door is open. So here's the problem. Every one of us have asked for something and we didn't get what we asked for. And everyone has sought for something and we didn't get what we were seeking for. And everyone has knocked on doors sometimes until our bloody knuckles were all that were left and we wrapped them up and walked away and the door never opened for us. And then we wonder, what do we do? We judge ourselves. And what we tell ourselves is, I didn't have enough faith or my faith wasn't authentic or my prayer wasn't long enough or it wasn't convincing enough or my behavior is not good enough and we turn this all in on ourselves and it looks like that's what what Jesus is saying like, what, if you ask and everyone who asks why didn't I get what I was praying for because I have asked God for things and by the way some important things sometimes some life or death things and I did not get the answer that I want and I am not alone every one of us know what this is like it's very hard to pray when we're judging, but Jesus puts it in perspective. It's not, it's not a disconnected thing. What does he say? He says, everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks fine, everyone who knocks the doors open for, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father? This is what he tells us. Our prayers are not answered because we're behaviorally superior. They're answered because we have an intimate relationship with God. And here's the thing. If you have kids, kids are not good at discerning what's best for them. Well, just go ahead. Go home. And for dinner today, Give them the choice between ice cream and whatever else you were making and see which they pick. Give me the choice between ice cream and whatever else you were making. I'll take the ice cream. I think most of you know ice cream is a vitamin in our house and we try to get our vitamin every single day. Kids want to drive a car before they're capable of driving a car. They want to take on responsibility that they're not ready for. Sometimes a parent says no, not because it's never, but it can't be right now because maybe it's not good for you or maybe you're not old enough or maybe you're not mature to handle the weight of that responsibility or maybe you don't have the strength or the competencies in order to be able to pull that off. And so the parent knows we've got to meter this out over time. And what Jesus is saying is that if you're not getting a yes answer, it's not because you are bad and it's not because God is stingy it's because you're not ready there's things you don't know there's things you're not able to manage right now and of course we go well no I can I can and that's exactly what our children tell us but our heavenly father loves us and he actually knows what's best for us. I'm going to have the worship team come up. Jesus finishes with this. So in everything you do to others, what you would have them do to you. For this sums the law and the prophet. It would be very easy to just, it would be easier if Jesus had just said, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. That's the easiest way out of this. And technically, that's what the law is. I don't want someone to steal from me, so then don't steal. I don't want someone to lie to me, so don't lie. I don't want someone to take my life, so don't take life. And at the end of the day, that's what the law is. 
Don't do to others what you don't want done to you, but Jesus doesn't end there. What Jesus says is do for others what you wish they would do to you. And he says, and when you do that, you don't just keep the law, you actually fulfill it. Can't do that and judge. It's not possible. Rather than judging others, this is what Jesus is saying, rather than judging others, try serving others. And I'm telling you, if the church ever gets back to the wisdom of Jesus on this, where we're not judging, we're leaving the judgment up to God, where we're not afraid to pray bold prayers, not because we think we're great or someone else is deserving, but we think God is really good and we're not afraid to ask. And if we look at others and we go, rather than looking for a reason to find that they're not worthy to me, for me to be able to help them, that's all I need, one reason. All I have to see is one fault, one flaw, anything at all. And I don't have to do anything good for them at all. That's all I have to find, one thing. And Jesus says, instead of looking for the one thing, do for them what you wish someone would do for you if you were in a similar situation. What happens? And this is what people will tell you. If you live like that, then all hell's going to break loose and people are going to live any way they want and, and our society is done. And Jesus said, that's not the way it works. You live like that and all heaven breaks loose and people find out how good God really is. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, um, <laughs> it's automatic. We've known it from our earliest days. We judge. It seems to be deep into our nature. Would you replace our nature with your nature? Would you help us assume there are things we don't know? Would you help us pray and ask for big and bold things? And rather than finding reasons to disqualify someone, would you help us find ways to help? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.